So Ted, let's kind of bring it back to testosterone replacement therapy. So you know, we've just gone down the rabbit hole pretty deep on the the molecular nature of prostate cancers and particularly the prostate cancers that are that are most lethal. Um, so now let's talk about a, a patient who wants to receive testosterone. Um, so presents in a hypogonadal state, um, is symptomatic uh, by all measures, should um, benefit from TRT. Um, what are the things that give you pause in that patient's clinical picture, either PSA level, family history, prostate size, presence of BPH, anything. How would you how would you counsel that patient specifically around the risk of cancer? And are there any scenarios where in a cancer free patient you would advise against TRT? I would say there's I can't think of any scenarios where I really advise against uh, TRT for somebody who is symptomatic and and has um you know there's so many other you know potential negative outcomes for a patient who has low t besides the possible development or, or detection of a prostate cancer so for me if you're hypogonadal i want to maintain your cardiovascular health i want to maintain your bone health your muscle mass all your cognitive function so i want to make you eugonadal for an individual who has prostate cancer who has low t um, it really comes down to what, how aggressive is their prostate cancer in terms of what I would advise them. So for somebody who has low grade prostate cancer, who's in surveillance, um, I'm doing surveillance to optimize their out, you know, optimize their total health. Right. And so I want to maintain them in a eugonadal state. So if they have, if they're on T replacement and they get diagnosed with prostate cancer, it's low grade, I'll maintain them on T replacement. I mean, let, let's just let's just pause there for a second, Ted. That's a remarkable statement. I'm sure there are many people that are kind of missing what you just said because it really flies in the face of what most doctors would believe. You're basically saying, if I've got a guy who's you know on TRT and his testosterone is humming along at 800 nanograms per deciliter, and he's been on exogenous T for a couple of years, but in the course of something, whether it be a rising PSA, he gets a workup. He finds his way into my office. We, you know, ultimately do a biopsy after an MRI and find that he's got a, a Gleason three plus three. Um, and you're saying you're not going to tell that guy he has to stop his testosterone. Is that is that what I'm hearing you say? Yeah, there's no evidence that says uh, exogenous T replacement uh, causes acceleration or propagation of someone's prostate cancer. There, there's no evidence to suggest that. And as you know. There's uh, what 30% of the population has a T that's 800 or higher, depending on their age, right? So yeah. it's a normal, it's a, within the normal distribution. Yeah. Would I encourage someone to be higher than that? No, but if that's where they've titrated their dose to be relieve their symptoms and and so forth, I'm comfortable having the discussion with the patient and saying, okay, here's how we, you have a prostate cancer. I think we can monitor and follow it. And there's plenty of people out there that I monitor and follow their their prostate cancers that have normal, you know, normally produced T's that are over 800, right? So, in my mind, it's no different. Yeah, very interesting. Than, than the other than anybody else, you know, who's within that normal distribution. So it, it is a radical thing, but yeah. if, if you just think about it, it's actually not it's not that radical really at all. Yeah, not not when you frame it that way, which is. If you have two people sitting in front of you, one of whom is supplementing to a level of 800, the other one is naturally at 800, and they show up with the same Gleason 3 plus 3 uh, cancer, you're going to monitor both of them. Um, you wouldn't say to the guy who's on TRT, well, I have to take your prostate out as a result of this or make you stop the T. And, and remember, so in a normal prostate, testosterone is 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 a is a differentiation factor. It will differentiate a, a prosthetic cell towards a fully functional benign epithelial cell. So conceptually, when I think about it, okay, let's just say that high T is, is uh, in a supplemented or endogenous is, you know, this circles back to the discussion we had at the very beginning. High T is associated with probably on average, a more well-differentiated tumor. Not 100% of the time, but 
that's what it's actually doing biologically within the prostate gland. It's differentiating these cells. Now, of course, it's a cancer, so it's maybe a little bit more genomically unstable than a benign cell and so forth, but that's kind of how it's do that's how it's working, right? Conversely, if you have a, a tumor that is in a low T environment, i.e. the original publications we talked about in NG, NEGM way back or other anecdotal series, those low, the tumors that develop in a low T environment, they're less dependent on androgens to grow. They often use other growth pathways to be aggressive. And actually, I think they're more, they're more worrisome because you don't exactly know how you're going to attack it or treat it if it actually progresses. So full circle, low-grade prostate cancer, guy comes in and his T is 600, guy comes in, you're supplementing his T to 600. To me, you should follow them both carefully and in the same way. Now, when you have a tumor that is a, a prostate cancer that requires treatment, so Gleason 7, 437, 448, more serious stuff, how do you handle those? That's where you really be, you come into differences. So um, when you are going to radiate, if someone is leaning towards radiation, that's where those individuals need to go on, and they do go on aggressive androgen suppression. So you're taking a, somebody, let's just say you're supplementing the six or 800, you're, you're taking them and you're making them zero again. Most men become incredibly symptomatic when you take their T to zero. That's part of the radiation sensitivity, sensitization that you need to do to treat a higher grade prostate cancer with radiation. Those individual men, I really will talk to them and say, look, I think we should do surgery for you. Why? We can maintain your testosterone. We may not run you at 800. We may bump you down to, let's say, 400. But that's just me being comfortable. As we talked about with the saturation theory, we're probably fully saturated at any of those levels. Right. We, 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 sh we can treat you with surgery. And as long as your pathology is favorable after surgery, you can continue with tes your testosterone supplementation so that you can maintain your, your full body health, frankly. So that is where, um, and I think more, more radiation oncologists are hesitant to restart exogenous T in somebody after, after one, six ART. months or two years of, of ADT yeah, with their radiation. Because just for the listener, when you do radiation, you're not removing all the prostate tissue. So if you have any residual benign tissue in your prostate after radiation, which you're going to have, and you give back T, you may cause a false positive in terms of a recurrence for that particular patient's tumor. So, so for, for those individuals, yeah, radiation can actually be more harmful because you're not able to supplement back up someone's low T to their normal, normal range afterward which of course not only happens in the man who we talked about who was hypogonadal before their diagnosis or before their treatment, but frankly, only you know 50 to 60% of men will actually recover normal levels of T after two years of hormonal suppression anyway. Mm. So you're really talking about inducing more hypogonadism in those men than you would have um, you know, even before.